begin with author and genealogist Donald Yates, who not only through his own Cherokee ancestry discovered his own Jewish roots, but he's also leading the charge in the DNA discoveries of the ancient roots of the Cherokee and other Native American communities. Welcome, and let's start by telling us about your specific background. I was born in Georgia uh, in the heart of the old Cherokee nation, and my mother was a double descendant of the last grand chief of the, of the Cherokee people, that's Chief Black Fox. And I discovered uh, the uh, original Cherokee origin narrative, which was recited at every green corn festival. All the young people were made to learn it in the olden days. And uh, the first words of it is, when we came from beyond the great waters. And it was the story of the Cherokee migration across the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> so, you know, that began to tell me that the Cherokee have, have a lot to them that people are not aware of, and that's certainly mm -hmm. true. So fascinating, and you've spent years writing the equivalent of two encyclopedias on the topic called Cherokee DNA Studies 1 and 2. So is it a myth that Native American peoples came across the Bering Strait as we're taught in school? They didn't come from Siberia or across some land bridge from Asia. They came from Europe. I remember I had a, a blog, Cher Cherokees came from East Mediterranean and spoke Greek. Oh, the wrath of God descended on me. People. You know, they thought, they thought I was a complete kook, but it's true. And uh, then later I got into the DNA and their DNA, sure enough, is, is from the same area too. That's Cherokee DNA studies too. More real people who proved the geneticists wrong. The uh, skinny on that is really the Indians came from Europe. <laughs> Their mitochondrial types are all old world from Europe. Wow. And tell us about the evidence of Jews coming to the Americas as early as the third century BCE and were among the so-called volunteer helpers who you say sailed with an Egyptian fleet organized by the wife of the Pharaoh, who was the queen of the sea. In fact, the name uh, for America was the White Land. Appalachian Mountains means the White Mountains. Uh, in, in Egyptian. Essentially, they originated as uh, Greeks and Egyptians and Libyan Jews uh, <laughs> in, the th in the third century BCE. So they spoke Greek. <laughs> uh, most of the Jews came from Cyrene or Libya or Elephantine. Uh, which was a Jewish fortress on the frontier. And they were very, very much prized by the Egyptians for their military uh, prowess. And they knew that the earth was round. That had been proved. You know, they knew about America back then. There were no dumb bunnies. And so she organized a fleet of uh, about 14 ships that left the port in the, on the Red Sea in, in Egypt, uh, and uh, they sailed to cross the Indian Ocean, and they took the northern route, and they established the international uh, dateline, which is essentially where it still is, 180 degrees away from uh, Alexandria, Egypt. And they landed in uh, Peru and left a inscription on, on a rock face claiming the whole land for Ptolemy the third. And your DNA company, company DNA Consultants has also shown evidence of uh, Cherokee having uh, DNA ties to the ancient uh, Phoenician and Minoan sea peoples who are believed to have uh, discovered the Americas thousands of years BCE. Explain. So the Jews were kind of fellow travelers with with the sea peoples. Uh, Phoenician really meant someone who uh, was a, a rich merchant or trader and dealt in luxury goods. But there were others before them, like the Minoans of Crete. You know, you could call all these people sea, sea people. A Phoenician, you know, the bird uh, rises from the ashes, and that became the national symbol for the Cherokee people, so that tells you something. And the uh, Cherokee had seven major uh, clans, 
and um, one of them was the Paint Clan. Well, that's the Phoenicians because the, that was their real name, the Paint People, you know, because they uh, controlled the the dye, the purple dye, which was one of the luxury goods of the ancient world. Wow, and you also got a specialty in medieval paleography during your PhD studies. Tell us more about the Bat Creek Stone written in Paleo-Hebrew and why it could be connected to the Bar Kokhba revolt of the second century CE. The Bat Creek Stone is uh, in square Hebrew cap capitals, uh, and it says a comment for Judah. It was found in a, uh, in a mound, Indian mound, this was a burial from the second century of the Common Era. There were uh, 11 people around him. What does that sound like? <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a minion, doesn't it? And all this was done by the Smithsonian. And Cyrus Gordon thought that uh, these were survivors of the Bar Kokhba uh, revolt of the second century. And they are said in rabbinical literature to have gone first to uh, Cyrene or Libya and then to Spain and then further west. Well, what's further west? America. <laughs> and what's been incredibly eye-opening are the countless Cherokee alive today discovering Sephardic Jewish ancestry, including yourself. Explain that. Turns out I'm a Jewish Indian, so, you know, we're mem members of the synagogue now. Just like my name, Yates, they want, they say, oh, well, that's Anglo-Saxon, isn't it? No, it's not. It's uh, an anagram in Hebrew for Ger Zedek. It's wow. the same name as, as Getz. In fact, Black Fox was not even Cherokee. He was Choctaw and half white. And the ha half of him that was white was a Scottish crypto Jew. Chief Black Fox was called by the US government, the Cherokee King. I'm descended from three of his daughters who married uh, Scottish Jews, essentially. So what's the daughter of a king, a princess? Well, the Indian princess was a Jewish princess. She was a Jewish American princess, one of the first. <laughs> In fact, also 18th century trader James Adair, who lived with and married a, a Cherokee woman, his book, The History of the American Indians, makes a clear cultural and genetic link between the Cherokee and Sephardic secret Jews. Adair was, was sec secretly Jewish, even though he big, brawny man looked like, you know, he could go in for those Scottish log rolling contests or something with a red beard. He was a, a typical Scottish Jew and a lot of them were. He, he reported on a lot of Jewish practices. You know, they had, they had their version of Yom Kippur and uh, they had their version of Sukkot. Adair even thought that they uh, played the melody of Kol Nidra there's a famous valley in North Carolina, Tow River Valley, which is famous for its gems and its gemstone mining. And it was, it was developed essentially by Jews. When the English went there, <laughs> they got chased off by men with beards. <laughs> uh, around uh, 1750, most Cherokees uh, had, had beards and uh, in 1730, seven of them were brought over to meet King George. And lo and behold, they have Jewish side locks, you know, Piot. Wow. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of amazing. And once you discover it, you say, well, how is this overlooked, you know? <laughs> So let's talk about the eye-opening discovery of who Sequoia really was, which is much more than the man who wrote the Cherokee syllabary in 1821. Sequoia himself was, uh, had a Jewish father, uh, um, Nathaniel Gist. The Gists were English Jews, uh, and uh, George Washington knew them. Uh, his statue is in the Capitol building in the rotunda. The inventor of the Cherokee uh, syllabary. No, that's not true. The Cherokee syllabary has existed for over 2,000 years, and it's an ancient alphabet. <laughs> uh, 
that doesn't go over too well because people like to cherish their their myths, you know. And I doubt whether that statue <laughs> in Washington will ever admit that he was half Jewish, you know. Wow. Uh, I don't I don't quite see that happening. Hmm. Thank you so much, Don.